Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to my talk. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed a great conference so far. Uh, my name is Maina Christian. I am from Austria. Uh, I work at Egalia at the graphics team, and I'm lucky that most of my time I can spend in the Etnavif GPU stack, um, an open source stack for Vivanti GPUs. Um, today I'm excited uh, to present you Meso 3D um, as an essential component in the Linux graphic ecosystems. Uh, we will explore Meso 3D, uh, which is the high-level graphic APIs down to the GPU execution, um, unlocking what I call the GPU magic. Um, by the end of this session, I hope you have a stronger grasp on how Mesa integrates into the broader graphics stack, especially on embedded systems. So, let's have a look at the agenda. Uh, we will start discussing why Mesa 3D is so important and relevant, then we dive into a little overview how GPUs are supposed to work. Then we will go through a little example to render just a simple red triangle. Um, after then, we will explore Mesa 3D's overall architecture. And we will look then at shader compilation and the command stream. Uh, keep in mind, there's an um, overview over this topic. There are so many technical details I cannot dive into, so I kept it very high level. So, why should you care about Mesa 3D? So, this conference is focused on embedded systems. Um, and most of these embedded systems have some kind of human-machine interface. And they are also often using automotive or industrial-grade system of stocks. Um, unlike consumer devices, manufacturers of embedded systems have to provide long-term support. We are talking about 10, 15, or even 20 years. Um, this means they are responsible for de um, delivering ongoing security fixes, bug fixes, and even software improvements over that period of time. And in the past, the closed source GPU drivers have made this difficult. Um, these closed source drivers are harder to update and have maybe some weak points that allow attackers to break into your system and gain root access. And that is a really um, serious security concern. And this is now why Mesa 3D becomes important. Mesa 3D is an open source solution that supports different rendering APIs like OpenGL, OpenGL ES, and even Vulkan. And by using Mesa 3D, manufacturers and developers have more control and flexibility compared to these closed source drivers. Um, with open source drivers, it is easier to fix these issues. When they come up, you are able to optimize the, the complete stack to your target device. And you can ensure that the system stays safe and fast over the lifetime of this product. So, overall, Mesa 3D makes it really easy to meet the long-term support goals, and you do not depend on closed source drivers. So, before we should talk what Mesa 3D does, I think it is a great idea to um, quickly have an overview on how GPU works. There are some terms I would like to explain. And the overall idea is that you can offload specific workloads from the CPU to the GPU, and this overall allows a faster, more efficient processing of complex visual data. So, um, in this GPU world, there's the term of a job. Let's call it a job. Um, and the job in this um, GPU operation that brings the GPU in a well-defined state and does a well-defined job that needs to be completed. Um, usually, you submit 
a job to the GPU. Um, and for a job, um, buffers play a really important key role there because they are acting as container for data. Um, these data can be, for instance, vertex data that you need to use for your rendering application. Um, and this structure that you have a job encapsulating all the needed information and buffers and data allows you to um, run them maybe in parallel if the GPU allows it. And, but, but this depends a little bit on the capabilities of the GPU. So this is really the basic understanding what a GPU job is. So um, then there's a big, big, big difference between CPUs and GPUs. CPUs are optimized to handle generic tasks, generic workloads much better than GPUs because GPUs are optimized for specific operations. And the GPU is also designed to run this little operation in ultra parallel mode. Let's call it, let's call it like that. And um, one thing that is important is to avoid, or to, to, to avoid issues like data corruption or race conditions. So it is crucial that the CPU and the GPU are synchronized. And this is where the term fans come into play. So a fans is more or less a synchronization mechanism that ensures that the CPU doesn't move on to dependent task until the GPU has completed its job or vice versa. So the next topic. Um, as I told you, unlike a, um, the CPU, which has typ typical a handful of powerful cores that is used for a wide range of tasks, a GPU has thousands of smaller specialized cores. Um, these cores are designed to handle really specific workloads and they are used with um, big data sets. Um, and this is the... Um, this architecture is what gives GPU its massive computational power, um, especially when it comes to things like rendering graphics. Um, each core um, is processing a small data of the big data set simultaneously, and this is the best selling point for a GPU. And it is used, therefore, in gaming, in scientific simulations, and other computational heavy workloads. So, um, now, as we basically have more or less an understanding of what a GPU does, the basic concepts, now it is important, as Mesa 3D is a user space library, we need to somehow talk to the GPU. That's now the role of the Linux kernel driver. And this driver, as I told you, is, um, has a responsibility to allow the software to talk to the GPU. And um, there are some well-defined interface, IOCTL interfaces, but each GPU provides its own set of own IOCTLs to allocate buffers and to be able to submit them. Because these, two, these two operations are special for each GPU hardware. Um, so overall, the kernel driver is responsible for buffer management as the user space needs to allocate some memory for the GPU. And the kernel driver needs to ensure that the GPU is accessing the correct memory in the command stream. Then the, the, the kernel driver has the responsibility for this event management or fencing mechanism that you can allocate events, you can process the events in the kernel driver. And also important thing in the embedded world is power management. Um, the kernel driver has a responsibility to power down a GPU if it's not needed, or to, to handle thermal throttling to prevent overheating. So, um, now, the kernel driver exposes some 
device nodes that, we, that the user space can talk to. Um, here on the slides, I have an example of an IMX-based board. And there are three nodes, as we can see. There's this card 0, 1, and the render D182. So um, we have two kind of nodes. We have this kernel mode setting nodes um, that provide a, a generic API, and they are used to control your display output, to configure your output, to allocate maybe a dump buffer. And then there are these so-called render-only nodes, which you can only use to render jobs. That's all they do. They allow you just to render jobs. There's no support for KMS, for, for, for scan out. And this combination that you have two um, split parts in the, in the graphics tag, that have one scan out and one render only, is very common in the embedded space as the SOC manufacturers choose different IP cores from different vendors and to put them into the SOC. And this makes it a little bit more complex to efficiently drive the GPU as there are two different vendors from, from the IP cores and you need to make it fly. Let's call it that way. Um, so the kernel provides now the infrastructure to submit the job, just to submit the job. And the actual job creation, this is handled in the user space. And this is now where Mesos 3D enters the, the stage. So to get a better feeling how, this, how, how Mesos 3D works under the hood, I thought about showing you how to render a simple red triangle. Um, and this is an example that every graphic programmer does once in its lifetime, because it's the basic example you can do. Um, we are using here OpenGL ES2 API, and I skipped a lot of stuff. There's no error handling. I missed maybe some important parts to just keep it simple and that it fits on the slides. So in order to render a triangle, we need some vertices that defines the points of the triangle. Um, as you can see, this is this vertices array. Now we need to take these vertices and upload it somehow onto the GPU. We are doing this by calling GL gen buffer, where we allocate the buffer object. Then we upload our vertex data via GL sub, uh, GL buffer data. And then the, the vertices data is in the GPU stored. So the GPU is ready to use this buffer later on. The next thing, so we are talking here about the modern application, not the legacy OpenGL 1.0. Uh, uh, we are talking here about modern OpenGL, so we need shaders to draw the triangle. We need here the vertex shader, where we take as input our vertices we defined before, and simply assign it to this magic thing called GL position. We don't care about it, what it is, it is just here. Um, so we have one part, the first shader. We need a second shader, as I told you, we want a fully red triangle. So we are using here now a fragment shader and assigning the GL frag color to red. So with these both shaders, we have now the middle ground to, to, to be done with the rendering. The next thing um, is we need to compile the shaders, to link the shaders. Yeah, that's what's shown here. And then after the linking step, the shaders are linked together and we can really use it for the rendering. So, and this is now the final step to really draw this red triangle on a black background. So we need to call GL clear color to set the background. Uh, the background to black, 
And then we need to attach the program to the current context. We need to bind the buffer that we would like to use for our virtual data. And then the most important API call here, GL draw arrays. Yeah, now we are finally drawing the triangle. So, with that in mind, you know now how the GPU works, how the application works, and how the interesting part starts. <laughs> um, as I told you, Mesa 3D is the key compo component. It supports a wide range of APIs, GPUs, and covering from desktop, mobile, and embedded platforms. So you find Mesa in every, in your gaming PC, if you run Linux, or in your embedded platform. So, this is a wonderful graphic I was drawing. <laughs> um, as Mesa is used as a foundation in the graphic system, we, Mesa is designed to share a lot of components between different drivers. So nobody needs to rewrite a GLSL compiler, for instance. And there are um, different interfaces doing different jobs. So we will look now at uh, GL Dispatch the Mesa Core API, the State Tracker, Gallium, and LibDRAM. I know many words, but I hope you have a better understanding later on. So, as we have seen, every OpenGL call in the example needs to be handled somewhere. And this is the, 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 the first thing we hit, is the dispatcher in Mesa 3D. Um, every OpenGL API call we made has an implicit context object. And the context is mm, more or less the whole OpenGL state that you can modify in your application. Every texture, every buffer object, every enable, and much, much more is in the context object. And so if you call, for instance, GL gen buffers, Mesa needs to use the correct context object to handle this operation. Because it is possible for an, applica for an application to create multiple contexts. So Mesa needs to know um, which context to use. So, so as I told you, it is really important that the right context is used. And keep in mind that this dispatch is done on every OpenGL function call. So there's a lot of overhead that we want to minimize. And there were different strategies to, to optimize this GL dispatch. So because it is really critical to have this done quickly. If you want to know more, there's a link. There are descriptions how it got fast, what different tricks that were used. So, um, we are now dispatched to the, in the correct context, and now we are in the generic layer that implements our rendering API. Um, I call it Mesa Core, not sure if that's the correct term. And here, for instance, we see the implementation of GL gen buffers. We see we get, we, we trying to look up the context, and we see that the context is an implicit parameter to every open shell function call in the state, in Mesa Core. And the Mesa Core is responsible for implementing the open shell, open shell ES APIs, but also doing validation of the API calls. Um, then the management of the context and the state it, it represents and in the, it also exposes the supported list of extensions and the supported OpenGL, OpenGL S2 or the 3 version that the system can provide. So it is a really generic layer doing all the heavy lifting for us. So the next layer after Mesa Core is called State Tracker. So the idea be behind this layering is that we have the generic code in, uh, in the upper layers, and as we move down, we get more generic to targeting our target GPU. So the state tracker translates now the Mesa Core API and function 
into something that is more easier to write drivers for um, and to optimize. So you might ask yourself why there is a state track. Yeah? And this is as historical reasons, because the next layer I'm talking about, that's the most interesting one, that's called gallium. And in the past, there were, were some classic drivers for old Intel GPUs that are not using the gallium thing. So as I told you, gallium. So gallium is the easiest API. So it's an, gallium is, is essential an API for writing graphics drivers in a large device agnostic fashion. It provides um, a middle ground abstraction that exposes all the services of uh, graphics hardware in a straightforward manner. Um, and this is responsible for translating, now we are going down, to translating the MESA core state, for instance, the clear color, the text state, the binded buffers, and the draw command in something more generic. So you could write an application targeting only the Gallium APIs and you could do rendering quite easy. Um, yeah, and if you write your first open shell driver, for instance, Gallium is the API you need to care about. You don't need to understand anything about open shell, about the different versions, the features you need to support. Just write the Gallium driver and the state tracker and the Mesa core will do its magic to figure out what feature your hardware supports and exposes the correct version of OpenGL and the correct supported list of extensions. So now, we are quite low level already, but we need to go a little bit deeper because now somebody needs to talk to the kernel driver. And this is the part of libdrm, it's called. Um, so Gallium uses libdrm to, for instance, query the capabilities of a GPU, allocates buffers, and submit jobs to the GPU. And as on the kernel side, libdrm has a lot of generic APIs to find the correct display, to atomic submits and stuff like this. But it also has this specific APIs targeting just one GPU driver. And there was recent work to move. The, the libdrm is an own project on its own, but there were recently some, some activity to move some parts directly into Mesa. For instance, as I work on the Edna Rift driver, the libdrm parts of the Edna Rift driver are in Mesa. So now, a quite interesting topic. As we have seen, um, modern GPUs need to be programmed. We have vertex shaders, fragment shaders, maybe some tessellation sh shaders. There are a wide range of different shaders, even compute shaders. And Mesa has a um, GPU agnostic compiler tool chain. So you, you have a tool chain. Mm -hmm. oh, God. Um, yeah, you have a generic tool chain. You don't need to write a TLSL compiler. You just reuse what Mesa provides for you. And in the end, your Gallium driver will be called with something you need to process further. Yeah. And um, the, the thing that's, that's in, in Mesa, so Mesa includes, as I told you, the GLSL compiler that takes the shaders as input and outputs something that's called NIR. And NIR is a flexible intermediate form of shader code that allows various lowerings and optimizations across different drivers. That's really cool. So the Edna Rift driver can use an optimization path that some AMD guy has written. So there's a lot of code sharing happening at this stage. And the, the really cool thing about NIR is that you can transform NIR into something that is better for your target hardware. If your target GPU doesn't support an, 
uh, square root operation, instruction, you can do the lowering to get the same result, but maybe with more instructions. And NIR also allows us to emulate missing features on the GPU. Um, for instance, if your GPU doesn't support uh, rectangular texture coordinates, you can emulate this with NIR. This is really an abstract representation that is easy to work with, has wonderful, nice APIs. But when you emulate features, it often comes with a performance drawback. As you're emulating something in, in slow shaders, maybe, that the hardware doesn't really support. So, um, in our red triangle example, we used two shaders, the vertex shader and the fragment shader. Now I would like to show you how the, the, the shader gets transformed from GLSL to near into Ethnovif GPU assembly. So, as you remember, my, maybe <laughs> that's the GLSL shader for the triangle demo, the, the vertex shader, that gets now processed by the GLSL compiler. So, this is the final form of near. That is that the Galleon driver sees. There are many, many, many transformations. There are many, many, many optimization steps. In between, we have, for instance, loop unrolling. We have algebraic optimization paths. But for the simple shader, it doesn't do that much. Um, as we can see, we are also assigning here the GL position. So yeah, it's really our shader we have seen before. So now it's the responsibility of the gallium driver to transform this into something that the GPU can understand. Um, in the case of the Edna Wiff driver, the resulting GPU assembly looks more or less like this. Um, and mm, as you can see, maybe the Edna Wiff ESA is a so-called VEC4 instruction set architecture, so it works with uh, vectors of four components. In contrast, modern GPUs these days are sc scalar based. Yeah, and we're using some registers, but we don't care really about the details. And we'll just show you the, the pipeline, what is happening here. And the same applies, yeah, for our fragment shader. So um, our fragment shader gets again transformed into near lowered by the gallium driver into something more or less close to the hardware that the driver doesn't need to do a lot of work. And as I told you, these are really simple shaders. We have more complex <coughs> shaders with uh, for loops or if-else branches, and then the gallium driver needs to do a little bit more work. This is just a really, really simple example. And again, we can see the, the shader assembly that the GPU understands. So now we have command bar, we have buffers to store our virtual data for the triangle. We have compiled the shaders into something that the GPU can understand. And now we need to create a job or a command stream, how it is called. And to, to finally draw the triangle to a buffer, we now need the command stream, and we need to bring the GPU in a well-defined state. If we, for instance, use in our rendering job uh, some clip planes, we need to set the clip planes for this actual draw to the defined state that the Mesa core, the gallium layer gives us. And we also need um, some buffers to reference, because on Aetna with on a modern, modern generations, the assembly is stored in, in buffer objects. So in the end, we have one buffer for the fragment shader binary, for the vertex shader binary, then the vertex buffer, and one, uh, one buffer for the render target where we render into. So <laughs> this is how it could look like on a GPU. This is taken from the Edna Wift driver stack. And you can see that, uh, yeah, maybe you can see it, that we set some base addresses. These are the buffers. The first two one are the render targets. Then we have the, mm, two more for the 
vertex and fragment shader, and so on. And the most important thing, um, until this draw instance, we're setting up the state for the GPU to bring it in a defined state for the actual draw command. And then we tell the GPU, hey, you have all your buffers, all your information, please do the draw. And that's this draw instance where we say, use this as triangles, yeah. And this triggers the GPU to actually do the work. Um, yeah, and this results then into this beautiful triangle. <laughs> um, so, I hope I could give you a little overview over how this whole GPU stuff works. Because when I started years ago, I would be happy to have, to have this information by my hand. And the most important thing is really that you need to do state emission and that you need to do this draw command thing. That's all, basically that's all you need to just render anything on a, on a GPU. Um, so, I'm in time, wonderful. So, thanks that you attended my talk and I think, I, I hope somebody gained some knowledge as it was really abstract. And it's time for some questions, if there are any. Okay. Yeah, keep the same microphone. There's no mic, okay. So my question is, how does the Vulkan API into the picture? Okay, the I repeat the question because it gets recorded. Um, how does Vulkan fit into the big picture? So the great thing about Vulkan is that it's more low-level API. So the application needs to do a lot of the work that mm, the state tracker that Mesa Core is doing. You could compare it to the, um, to, to the, the Gallium API, which is a little bit low level. And yeah, that, that's basically it. So all this, this, this state management thing that the OpenGL API does for you, you need to do it in your application. Because it is a more low level API, the Vulkan API. Thank you. But the cool thing is that there's still a lot of code sharing happening in the Vulkan driver ecosystem in Mesa 3D. Right, so to follow up on that, how about OpenCL? Okay, OpenCL, yeah. Uh, what about OpenCL? Um, there is now Rusty CL, that's a Rust-based implementation of the OpenCL API. And the cool thing, as I told you, focus only on the Gallium API, cause Rusty CL calls into the Gallium API. You get the same thing like on for, for, for rendering the triangle. You get all the state you need. You get the shaders in near, and it's basically the same if you do a rendering job or open cell from a far perspective. Hey. So to follow up on that, at now we've an open cell, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. <laughs> okay. To, to, to tell you a bit more, I've been working the last two to three months exclusively on this feature. There will be a new backend compiler and there will be an XTC talk about it. That got accepted. So yeah, and I'm passing almost all OpenCL piglets and uh, OpenCL CTS test suite doesn't look good too. So I'm on the finishing line, yeah. Okay. When there are no questions, thanks a lot. <laughs> hmm.